on BBC Two in the North East and Cumbria a change to the advertised programme. After days of drama and scandal involving Newcastle United, Close Up North investigates what effect the revelations will have on the game, the club and the whole of the region. In a week that rocked football, Jackie Hodgson introduces sex, dogs and videotape. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to this special Close Up North. Sir John Hall today took up the reins of power again at St James Park and called upon the famous Toon Army to pull together to save Newcastle United. Can the team and the city of Newcastle restore its battered reputation? And what will be the legacy of the affair for the multi-million pound business that is football? Thousands of you have been ringing our telephone poll to see if you think that the club has done enough to restore the confidence of fans. We'll have the results later. On tonight's Look North, Sir John said the disgraced directors were the victims of an elaborate scam. It's out of, completely out of character with basically Douglas and Freddie, completely. And at the end, we'll get to the bottom of it, but it was a scam. You know, it cost a lot of money. We'll be putting those claims to the editor of the newspaper that broke the story, the News of the World. And we'll be talking to the people that really matter, the fans. Simon Willis is with some of them at a working men's club in Newcastle. Well, a lot's happened today. In fact, a lot's happened in the last few hours. We will hear live what the supporters think of it all. Well, more from the fans later. But first, the story that has dominated the news for the last 10 days. How did it happen? And were the journalists right? I read the news today, oh boy. Come here! Come here! The news on BBC Radio Newcastle 95.4 FM. Strong opinion and speculation has continued for a second day after newspaper claims that Douglas Hall and Freddie Shepherd insulted and exploited Newcastle fans. From the moment it appeared on the front pages of Britain's biggest selling newspaper, the Newcastle United scandal exploded like a bombshell. It was a story that gathered momentum as the days went by. This was a classic News of the World sting. Hidden cameras, secret microphones and a reporter posing as a businessman. That, almost more than what was said by his son and business friend, infuriated Sir John and the club. The vilification that both Douglas and Faddy have been put through has been terrible to watch. Yes, it's been self-inflicted, but the question has to be asked, why were they targeted? But local journalists defend the way the story was obtained. The PCC, the code that we all adhere to, as we do on the Chronicle, makes it very clear that you can use subterfuge, you can use those sort of devices, as long as it's in the public interest. And I think that they would suggest very strongly that a story involving two people so high up in a premiership club with that amount of control um, behaving in that way and talking about the region and the fans in that way is in the public interest and, and there's no doubt about that. As the media gathered, the storm grew. The news of the world's sales rocketed. The story dominated the agenda. What I think is most fascinating about this story is the way that it was handled after the News of the World did it. If the papers in Newcastle had rallied round these men and said, well, so what, they didn't do anything wrong, it's just the southern London-based newspapers against the northeast. If national newspapers, instead of following up the News of the World in the way they did it, either ignored the story or uh, downplayed it, then again, I don't think they would have been forced to resign. But whilst the news of the world led the way, its tactics were questioned. Where is the public interest defence to this story? They're not committing any crime. These are, after all, men who, whatever their public role is, surely deserve a private life. If they wish to spend their money uh, mixing and consorting with prostitutes, and if they wish to have, get drunk, and they wish to say outlandish things, uh, about their lives, and we all do it for goodness sake, uh, then surely they have a perfect right to. On Tyneside, the local paper was almost overwhelmed by the response to relentless front page news. 
particularly on day one when I think, you know, we took a strong line straight away um, and we had a lot of phone calls into the paper to say, well done. From St James Park, the silence was deafening. Spin doctors say it was a public relations fiasco. If you're going to apologise, you've got to do it soon so people think you mean it. And it also would have helped if they'd had some sort of act of contrition as well. Uh, they could have done something like organising a charity football game uh, with uh, Douglas and Freddie giving £5 to charity for everybody who turned up in a Newcastle United shirt. Pictures like this, Mr Shepherd on a beach in the West Indies, didn't help. So was it a fair cop? I think that it's riven with hypocrisy. Loads of people in Newcastle do roughly the same. At a different level, maybe. They're not travelling the world, they're not getting on a private jet to do it, but they do roughly the same. And yet here they are saying, they're a disgrace, pull them down. I wonder if when they wake up this morning and think, what, what, should we have done that? And after a couple of pints, they may very well be saying to themselves, we were wrong, weren't we? So today's press conference leaves the club a mountain to climb. For the chairman, it creates a presentation problem. Just a few days ago, he was backing his son and friend. Now, whatever the question marks over the tactics that brought them down, Douglas Hall and Freddie Shepherd have gone. Well, earlier I spoke to the editor of the News of the World, Phil Hall. I asked him about Sir John's claim that the newspaper had set up the two directors in an elaborate scam. I think that's complete rubbish. I'm, I'm, I'm rather saddened to hear that Sir John has said that. I think the resignation of his son and uh, Freddie Shepherd has left a rather nasty taste in the mouth. I take no joy in what's happened, but I think if they'd come out and apologised immediately after the event, and the day after we'd run the story and said, we're very sorry, we made a mistake, we shouldn't have said it, I think the people of Newcastle would have forgiven them. But lots so of people go out for... An... They tried to suggest that we set them up, that the couple, uh, the two men were, were drunk when they said these things. So we released a video to prove that what we were saying was true and they were not drunk. They were stone cold sober and they knew what they were saying. You're absolutely convinced of that because lots of people do go out and have one too many, don't they? Absolutely, but you've seen the video and you can see they're stone cold sober. And you can also see that they, t they took very little prompting. I mean, I've, I've offered the authorities in the football club the tapes. I mean, within five minutes of us meeting the two men, they began bragging. Why and did you what, do... And now people know what they say. Why did you do this? Why did we do it? Because we had a call from a Newcastle fan who said that he was aware that both the chairman and, uh, and, uh, Sir Douglas, Hall, and sorry, Douglas Hall were misbehaving and um, that they were bragging and generally vilifying the people of Newcastle. So what? we decided that was a matter of uh, public interest. And I think when you look at uh, what the surveys have said, 97% of people surveyed in Newcastle thought they should resign. I think that fully justifies what we did. Of course, if they'd gone out and behaved themselves, that would simply have been a gross intrusion of their privacy, wouldn't it? Well, it wouldn't because it wouldn't have been published. So you would have been happy to set them up? No, we didn't set them up. Uh, what we did was we, uh, we went in undercover. I mean, I think you're being naive if you really feel that we can go and knock on the doors of two people like this and say, excuse me, we've had a report that you're misbehaving, you're hanging around in a brothel in Spain and you're vilifying the people of Newcastle. What do you think their reaction would have been? They would have said, we don't know what you're talking about. So we went in undercover to uh, get some facts and substantiate the story and, and that's exactly what we did. And of course, as you now know, Freddie Shepherd went to the High Court on Friday and appealed to the court to try and ban our story on Sunday. A no lesser authority than a High Court judge said, the news of the world is right, he has no right to protection from law, and uh, he was not set up. So in a word, would you do it again? Uh, yes, I would do it again, but uh, I think it'd be wrong to do about Newcastle. So I think we didn't set out to expose Newcastle United. There are just two rotten apples there, and I hope sincerely that the fans get behind the club, because they're a great club. Alan Shearer and people like Kenny Dalglish swept blood for that club, and they deserve every support they can get. Well, here in the studio, we've got supporters, business experts, a former Newcastle player and David Conn, the author of The Football Business. David, do you approve of the News of the World tactics? Well, I take my hat off to them, really. I mean, uh, Phil Hall's just said everything that needs to be said about the public interest issue. Uh, that can, that's been decided in court and uh, Newcastle lost. And um, the fact that we're here and the fact that so many people have been interested in the story seems to prove that there was a public interest in it. That's slightly different to the public being interested in it and a public interest defence, isn't well, it? Well, I, I think that one of the main things that's come out of this story is the huge amounts of money that are being made by the directors and shareholders of football clubs in the Premier League now. And this has shown um, some quite tawdry ways in which they seem to be spending their money. And was there not another way of doing it? Well, I think, uh, as a journalist, um, 
uh, you yourself probably know that Phil Hall's right, that um, you are allowed to use undercover uh, tactics where that's a way to discover the truth. If you went and knocked on their door, they, they, I'm sure that they would have denied the story. Uh, John Anderson, as a player, it's often argued that, that the press intrudes on players' lives. Do you think that's true? Do you approve of the tactics? Um, I don't know whether I approve of the tactics. I think um, it's been done and what they said was out of order. Um, I think the most important people in football club is the players and the supporters. Um, and I think once you go around and start saying what the two, two men said about the supporters, who at the end of the day pay their wages, and the majority of supporters wanted them to go, uh, I think they should have went earlier than they did, if they wanted what was best for the supporters and Newcastle United. Nicola Hawkins, a legitimate tactic for you as a fan, did you want to see that in the newspaper? Uh, yes, I would like to know what uh, the people who are running my club think of the fans, and I think it was um, needed to be said. If they were bad mouthing the fans, the people of the North East, especially the women, I think it should have been said. So you've got no qualms about the way it was done at all? No. As, I, as it's been pointed out uh, before, if they just knocked on the door, they would have denied everything. So you're happy about it? Yes. You're happy about the way it was done? Mm -hmm. Uh, David Conn, you've argued long and hard that, that journalists don't take sports reporting seriously enough. Do you think this is an example of this? I do. I just think it's a shame that it's taken so many years uh, for the people who own football clubs in the new era when there's so much money about to be exposed for the amount of money that they're actually making. And what I think is a shame is that it took the news of the world to go undercover, uh, apparently in a brothel in Marbella, for this to come out. If you look at the cuttings, as I have, if you look at the newspaper reports over the years of the Hall era, they've had almost nothing but praise, they've been called philanthropists, that it's been said they're doing it for the good of the community, the good of the town, and I feel that the sports journalists have to get their act together and start to scrutinise these multi-millionaires for what they are. All right, well, let's find out now what the fans think about how the media has handled the story. Simon. As you can imagine, there's uh, quite a few differing opinions here. Let, let's, start, let's start down here with Steve Wraith. What, what do you think of the way this has all been handled? Well, I'm very disappointed the way it's been handled. Um, obviously, uh, as has been vilified by a lot of people, Douglas Hall and Freddie Shepard have made idiots of themselves, um, as well as tarnishing the, the club's good name. But as far as I'm concerned, um, I don't think it warranted nine days high media coverage on a lot of the main TV channels. I don't think it should have been the top story. I mean, today we'll have Saddam Hussein attempting to bring anthrax through in duty freeze to, you know, to poison us all. Yet Newcastle United is the top story on many of the major news channels. Um, what would you prefer not to have known about this, Steve? Have they just gone on? No, no, obviously, it, to me, you know, to know what the chairman and the vice chairman have been getting up to in the spare time is obviously a public interest, and obviously the media feel that it's a public interest. I do, however, feel that um, it's probably a cynical view, but I do, however, feel that, you know, this is probably somebody at work behind the scenes trying to bring the good name of Newcastle United down. We've had five or six years in the public spotlight as the entertainers, and now we're suffering the big hangover. People are trying to knock us down, and I would like to know why. OK, well, I'm sure there's no suggestion that any of the newspapers were doing that, but let's see, uh, John, John Regan, what do you think about the way the media's handled this? Well, I'm not here to defend the um, methods of the news of the world, but surely it was right that these men's attitudes to the fans are exposed. I mean, after nine days of horrendous publicity for the club, there's only two men to blame, and that's Douglas Hall and Freddie Shepard. How about the way it's gone on, though, and been repeated in the news? Well, I think it's correct <coughs> that pressure was kept on these men to resign. Nine days ago, they, they, should, have the, they should have resigned then, and, and all this would have been forgotten about by now, but they've, dra they've dragged it on, not the fans, not the press. It's Douglas Hall and Freddie Shepard have dragged this on for nine days, and it's a disgrace it's gone so long. There's only one conclusion after the first allegations that was for them to resign. It's unfortunate it's taken so long, but now let's get back to sporting the team, get three points out on the side of and go on to win the cup. Kevin Miles, we've seen a lot of you on the media over the last few days, uh, but, but how, really, how do you think the story's been handled? I mean, you've probably encountered more camera crews in the last week than you would in a year. Well, if, if the story is dragged on in the media, the responsibility lie, for that lies with the breathtaking arrogance of the two individuals who, who defied public opinion for more than a week. <laughs> 
when everybody on Tyneside, with very few exceptions, wanted them to go. <coughs> and if they prolonged the agony, then the responsibility for that as well lies in their court. John Hall said today that these people aren't MPs, they're not arms dealers. In a lot of ways, Newcastle United means a lot more to a lot of people on Tyneside than MPs and arms dealers do, and therefore I think it's only right that their actions are exposed and should stay in the public spotlight until they do something to correct it. OK, Kevin, thanks very much indeed. We'll, we'll come back to the rest of everyone a little later on, but for now, Jackie, back to you. Thank you very much, Simon. As he says, more from the fans later in the programme. A reminder now that you're watching a Close Up North special on the week that rocked football. The club is now back in the hands of Sir John Hall. It's an uphill task. He has to save both the club and his family's involvement in it. David Morrison looks back at Sir John Hall's career and his association with Newcastle. The hubris of two men has caused all this. Hubris, not a well-known word. The dictionary defines it as insolent pride which invites disaster. No doubt Hall and Shepherd would describe what's happened to them as just that, a disaster. It's now up to this man to make sure that doesn't happen to the club and his family's control of it. And he has until summer to do it. People trust him. People have a great faith in him. People believe in him, and that's what's needed just now. And that's why I think it's wonderful he's prepared to work with his own domestic issues, but at the same time come back and involve himself and face up to the community, because we all believe in him. Sir John was born into a mining family at North Seaton near Ashington 65 years ago. He moved into property development after working in the local pit and training as a surveyor. I'm from the working class. You may see me sitting in this, but I am from a background which had nothing, had nothing. His big break came in the early 1980s when he took advantage of redevelopment grants to build the Metro Centre at Gateshead. By 1987, it had made him at least £70 million and opened new doors to power and wealth. The money allowed him to pursue what many on Tyneside would regard as a more ambitious goal. By the end of the 1980s, Newcastle United were in trouble. The club was on its way down. The fans wanted change. Hall's Magpie Group launched a bid to save the club and fought chairman Gordon McKeague for control. Hall single-mindedly went after United, yet miraculously peace broke out. McKeague and Hall united for a share issue. We have uh, agreed together that uh, the concern is to work in cooperation with one another for the future of Newcastle United. And we it collapsed. Nine months later, McKeague was out. The way was now clear for Sir John Hall, as he had now become, to take over the chairmanship, even though he'd always denied he wanted it. In February 1992, he pulled off a masterstroke. He got the prodigal son to return, Kevin Keegan. I think it's great. Yeah, it's great. The new, I think the he's going to do a hero, like. He's going to do a lot for Bring the club the as well as increase yeah. the gear. Like. Glory beckoned. There was much to celebrate. The club began to deliver what Hall had promised. It bought and bought and bought and rose, and rose, and rose. On the whole, the club spent around £50 million on transfers, only to see its dreams of the Premiership title turn to ashes in 1996. Then, plans for a new stadium on land near St James Park ran into strong opposition. Eventually, redevelopment of the existing ground became the least contentious option. Within months, Keegan was gone. They're worrying, they go, I've got a clue who will take over now. Hall provided the answer, Dalgleish. And Kenny, you know, you've come to a big club, you're used with big clubs, and can I say from all of us, myself, the board, the fans and everybody out there, welcome, and I hope your years at Newcastle United are very successful. Thank you. It paved the way for the club's flotation on the stock exchange and the Hall family's continuing domination of the club. But the results they expected never materialised. When Sir John Hall handed over to Freddie Shepherd last December, dreams of competing for the Premiership title this season turned out to be just that, dreams. 
Well, earlier the BBC spoke to Sir John Hall. He said the allegations had devastated his family and paid tribute to his son Douglas and Freddie Shepherd. They've never lost the love for that football club. When you look back over the years, it was them that brought me back into the game. It was they that brought basically Kevin Keegan here. They're the ones who put raised the cash for the new stadium. They're the ones in the Santa Cruz Island share here. I was the chairman, and it's all been forgotten like that. All been forgotten. You're all sitting there ready to hang them and basically love some remarks. And I say, it's, they were, it's out of, completely out of character with basically Douglas and Freddie, completely. And at the end, we'll get to the bottom of it, but it was a scam. You know, it cost a lot of money. And the things that happened to us last week, you know, trying to go out of my house and there's the Goodyear blimp going over the gardens. Somebody in the region sold his story to the national press for 10,000, walked out of the door, came round to us and said, I won't say this if you give me 15,000. These are the sort of abuse we've been subject to. Nobody should have to go through that. If they've done wrong, yes, fine, OK. But in a sense, eventually, they'll get a chance to say their piece. But if they try to come back now, what are you going to do? You're going to murder them. Well, Nicola, is he the man you want back? Um, no, I have my doubts. Um, he's still defending Douglas and he's still defending Freddie Shepherd. Um, they're the ones that did wrong. If only he'd said to, to the press, look, his son's done wrong, Freddie's done wrong as well. We accept that. We all apologise. He is my son. We can accept that. It's family loyalties. He is my son, but um, it's only temporary. But he's the man who rescued this club that you're so passionate about. He so is, so. yes. He, but he's still a businessman at the end of the day. John Hall used to support Sunderland as a boy. And um, he, because the chance to became to own, well, own a football club, be a part of a grown industry of football, um, he took that upon himself. He became a, um, a Newcastle supporter. But he was a Sunderland supporter originally. And he's now, he's now made a lot of money on it. He's made a lot more than he paid out for the club. And uh, I hope he takes heart from the fans, actually. I mean, we're not, we're not really wanting to have a go to his family personally. But I would like it if he would take note of the passion that's been involved the last nine days and said, uh, that they answered the questions of the fans, saying that we would like a voice on the, on the board. All right. Uh, David Young, will it satisfy the city initially? Steady hand on the tiller now. I think so. Um, I think we, we still have the issue that the whole family controls the majority shares in the club. But that's been the case all along, and it's not unheard of for public companies. I think what the club has to do, first of all, obviously, is to avoid relegation. But going forward, the club had enormous goodwill um, until relatively recently. And I think there has been seen some attacks from the press, other than the ones we've seen in recent days. Um, it's possibly the case of knocking down the, um, the, 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 big, the big club when the opportunity was there. What the city needs is to see that goodwill rebuilt. It's essential for the finances of the club. All right. Uh, David, come, will it stop journalists like you in his back in control? Will it, stop you? Like me, will, it stop, will it stop you investigating? No, I mean, the journalists should be investigating. That's their job. And it always makes me laugh when people who've really enjoyed um, a, a good press from the papers, which Sir John Hall's enjoyed a phenomenal press, locally and nationally, uh, the first time there's a negative story, uh, they go ballistic. Um, he's enjoyed his PR and he's enjoyed his press very much. He's also enjoyed the money. I mean, one of the things that was missing from uh, the report on the flotation was that uh, in the battle with McKeague and the subsequent takeover of Newcastle, it cost the whole family around £3 million. On flotation, their share was worth £102 million. They've made around... They made... The shares have dropped in value a little bit, but they've made fortunes out of Newcastle. Right, so, so it hasn't really satisfied one fan. It may have satisfied the city. It hasn't satisfied you. Has it satisfied the players, the people inside the club, John? I don't think there was any doubt that he was going to be the man to take over. I don't think there was anybody else. Um, he might have relinquished the chairmanship, but he always knew what was going on. I mean, anybody who's seen the interview earlier will see that he actually sanctioned the trip to the Emirates. He said when the two lads went out there, when Freddie Shepherd went out and Douglas Hall went out, I actually sanctioned it. I said it was OK. So is he the right man long term? Um, I don't see why not. I don't see who else is big enough um, to take the job on. All right, well, thanks just for the minute. The Hall dynasty is back in charge, but is the resignation of two directors and the return of Sir John enough to calm the anger and restore fans' confidence? That was the question we put to you in our telephone poll, and more than 3,000 called to put their view. It's clear that the fans are still far from happy. 
726 people felt that the club had done sufficient. That's a little under a quarter. But 2,395 felt the club hadn't done enough. A huge 77% of those who phoned. Well, the fans seemed to have spoken. Does that poll reflect the mood of supporters where you are, Simon? Well, actually, a lot of people here have, uh, have an opinion that quite a few Sunderland supporters might have been ringing and skewing that vote. But let's just see what a few people think here. Leslie, what do you think of that phone poll? Have they done enough to satisfy you, the club, in what they've done recently? Not for me so far. They're about 80% of the way there on that score. I think a lot of fans feel that they've been made to feel that they don't matter. And I don't think you can make people feel they do matter overnight just by these two guys resigning. I think it goes deeper than that now. At the minute, all I want to do is support my team. I think the next few weeks are going to be crucial on the pitch, and I think off the pitch, I'll reserve judgment on that question until the end of the season. Now, Kevin, you were saying to me earlier that you think all this could be forgotten very soon. Yes, I feel as though like get two or three good results, and the whole thing like, like it could be like yeah, forgotten about. Uh, and the whole story is about two people, um, uh, and those two is gone now. So I just feel as though like. Just go forward from here onwards. Right, so they have done enough to satisfy you. Steve, uh, how about you? Just, have, have they done enough to satisfy you? Steve? I don't go much by by phone votes on anything, really. I mean, I'm more interested in you know, where the money goes on these phone votes. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the two men have left, and I would much agree with Kevin. As far as I'm concerned, they should be swept under the carpet. Let's concentrate on Southampton, Wimbledon, and Sheffield United, get the points in the bag, get away from the relegation zone, and get into our first FA Cup final since 1974. Neil, you satisfied by that? I agree. What Steve says, I'm just more, more or less interested in what they do on the pitch. I couldn't really give a monkeys about phone polls. No. Similar as that. So, I mean, so do you think that's a fair reflection of opinion, though? Not really. OK, Barry, how about, how about you? Do you th have, have they done enough to satisfy you? Uh, well, every, I think everybody's really satisfied now. Well, they should be. I, I'm satisfied. Just got to get on, like, to see on the pitch. That's where it matters, on the pitch. OK, thank you very much. Jackie, back to you. OK. Well, whatever the case, one of the key questions Sir John faces is what is the long-term future for his company's huge shareholding in the club? As Rebecca Skippage reports, there are several options. Next month sees the anniversary of the flotation of Newcastle United PLC. A year ago, Sir John Hall pledged not to sell even part of Cameron Hall's stake until at least November of this year. That was intended to reassure the city that he wouldn't just cut and run. But with so much held by one shareholder, the city has always been uneasy, with so much power vested in just Cameron Hall. And the events of last week would suggest that was a justified concern. The question now is what's the long-term future for Cameron Hall's majority stake? The Halls could keep their power base, although many believe that will be at least gradually reduced. Alternatively, Cameron Hall could sell a significant chunk of the shares to someone who shares their ambition for the club and would support them in any hostile takeover bid. The dramatic option is to sell up, but so many shares released at once would depress the price and the Halls would lose money. Whatever happens, Newcastle has been good to the Halls. The original investment of around £5 million has been repaid many times over. David Young, you're the financial expert. What would you do with these shares? I think, um, as, as your tape says, it wouldn't be an option really to dump them on the market. Um, I think, to be fair to the whole family, while their shares are worth a great deal more than they, than they were worth th than what they paid for them, um, they haven't really taken any money out of the club. They risked what were substantial sums. Um, and they built the club up into you know, a tremendously different um, entity than it was when they came in. Um, what would they do with the shares? I think the city would probably quite like them to reduce their, their share below a majority holding. Why? The because the city likes to see um, that, that a club will act in the interest of all the shareholders rather than perhaps just a group. Um, right, well, that's a good point, isn't it? Because it's, it's this PLC, it's the non-executive directors, who it seemed were forcing the hand all the time, keeping the momentum, keeping the pressure yeah. up. So, in fact, the city had, the PLC has exerted an influence. I there. think this worked today. I think that, um, obviously, a combination of things um, caused the events of today. But uh, it seemed that the final stage in that was the actions of the non-executive directors, who were very concerned about the reputation of, of the club and their own reputation. David Conte, you've argued quite a lot about democratising football, about moving it on and having more control for the fans, for example. Didn't we just see that? A group of non-executive directors looking after the interests of 9% of the shareholders actually exerting an influence. 
Well, I'm sorry, but it just always makes me laugh when people start talking about whether the city is happy or not. I mean, here you've got an institution which is supposedly a symbol of the North East, and nobody talked more than Sir John Hall about what it meant to the North East. Yeah, but let's deal with realities. This is how it works now. The strings seem to be being pulled, if if what's been said is right, by the City of London. And why are they exerting an influence over Newcastle United Football Club? We had non-executive directors with just 9% of the holdings. But the, the, the PLC was blamed, in a way, for, for forcing Keegan out, and yet here it actually seems to have done something in the interest of the fans, doesn't it? Well, I don't think it is in the interest of the fans. It's in the interest of the shareholders because they were worried that the share price was dropping. The fans may be happy in the short term, but I think it would be a great shame if uh, a couple of good results see this forgotten. The, sh- the fans are the ones who have paid for this club to recover, not the whole family. The bondholders who were given a bond in exchange for just the right to buy a season ticket put four and a half million pounds into that club and they've got no stake in it and no say in it. They're just watching all this scandal happen and they have no power whatsoever. Nicola, do you think you've got any power? No, not at the moment. But I would like to see power. Um, John Hall's always compared Newcastle to Barcelona. He wants to make a new Barcelona in the North East. Um, the people of Barcelona actually elect their president to run the club. Everyone has one vote, it doesn't matter if you're the the rag and bone man or you're a millionaire. And I think that should happen here. The fans should have a say in what goes on in the club. Would the players endorse that? I'm not really sure, but I think um, from what we've heard, the supporters are the most important things in a football club. Um, And the supporters of Newcastle United have probably been the most loyal in the country. Um, Through the bad times, they turned up in the thousands and when things started to go well, I mean, there's waiting lists for season ticket holders. There's 36,000 season ticket holders at St James's Park. Right. David, is Nicola being realistic? Football is in the hands of big yeah. businessmen. Isn't it? I, I don't think it. I don't think it is realistic. It's a lovely idea, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at what the halls have achieved, they took a club that was in a lot of trouble. They channeled the the support of the fans into providing a, a huge amount of money to buy players, to buy the best managers that there were. They, they built the club up into a state where it could go to the city and raise £40 million to pay off the debts and buy the players, to take it to the success that it's had. And the only way forward for a club today is to have the money to buy the best players. David Gunn? Well, I think you have to be an accountant to admire people's ability to channel other people's money into their own company, uh, which is what's been described. You know, Is that a great ability to channel supporters' money into the football club? I think we've got to realise, though, I mean, football's all about money now. It's, it's, it's huge money, Sky but Is that right? Over. Is that it doesn't necessary? matter whether it's right or not. That, unfortunately, that's wrong, the way it is. But if and it's not wrong, a lot we, that we people, can do about the it. FA, even the government with this task force, should look at ways to stop it if it is wrong or if parts of it are wrong or if effects of it are wrong. And I think what you're seeing now is the unravelling of sexy football and you're showing that underneath it all, We've got a few people making an awful lot of money and supporters who've paid for it. OK, well, we're moving on to some wider questions now because it's often been said that when Newcastle United does well, the whole of the region benefits. So the opposite may inevitably be true. We've tested opinion in London to see if the North's image has been tarnished and we sought the advice of the professional image makers. Simon Willis reports on how the experts would bring the shine back to the Tyne. For years, this was the North. It was defined by its heavy industries, coal, steel, shipbuilding. And when they were no more, the region's identity was also in danger of vanishing. What was the North all about? Few transformations have been more dramatic. The old industrial grime was swept away by the sheer energy of the people as the North recast itself as a home for new industry a centre for the arts, a party town and home to Newcastle United. Each carried the other on a wave of enthusiasm until the day the wave came crashing down. Just a few weeks ago, Newcastle United was running high. It was involved in European competition. The image of the club was, was buoyant around the world. It was a beacon, really, for the success of the North East. And here we are, 10 days, two weeks into a crisis which should never have been and it's dragged the name of the North East and the city right down into the mud. Dan Kirkby's public relations company has offices in London and Newcastle and prestigious clients. 
When hired by West Ham Football Club in 1989, he set up a community relations scheme to bring the club in touch with its grassroots. There needs to be a new deal for supporters. Newcastle United must accept that the actual view of supporters is paramount to the success and future of the club. We need boardroom representation immediately for supporters to actually come in and express their views. The club needs to make it very, very clear that they're going to take immediate steps to actually win back the support and trust of their broad base of fans. So has the scandal changed the way others see us? This was what people in London today thought about Newcastle. Brown Ale, football. Newcastle, yeah, Newcastle Brown Ale. You know, I think of uh, Viz. Viz? Viz magazine, yes. And Sid the Sexist. Newcastle, cool. The great North Run, which I did once before. Uh, the football team, obviously. Um, bridge, nice place, good people. It's very nice out there. Good night out on a Thursday. Yeah. Do you think the image of the city's been damaged by these allegations, though? Not so much the city. I think uh, the people in Newcastle are a bit too big in the boots for that. Like, they're strong, they'll bounce back. They're a loyal bunch of supporters, but uh, it's had some damage in effect, and I don't think they'll ever be repaired, or certainly not over the next one or two years. Well, we're not going to be able to undo it. What's been done has been done. I would do it with wit and wit and... Uh... But perhaps the damage can be repaired. We gave two advertising agencies just a few hours to devise a campaign to restore the image of the club and the region. Let's look at the icons that are going to change the story and flip it over onto the other side. We've seen the negative aspects in the last couple of weeks, so let's turn it over and see what the positive aspects are. Now, of course, the last time Newcastle United rose from the ashes, if you'll pardon the expression, was when Sir John Hall took control. And here he is, coming back to take control again. So obviously, we're using John Hall as one of the key icons to show that there are good returns. We thought, well, these people have actually, like, slagged off the north of England. They've put down the, the women of the north of England. So this idea is based upon actually disassociating yourselves from them, the fact that nobody, not all the people in the northeast, are actually tarred with the same brush and all have the same opinion of the northeast. So that was the first concept we came up with. Uh, the second one is the fact that there's a lot more behind this story than they actually tried to present to everybody. The, the papers are really... It's the papers that are actually the culprits in this. The papers are actually really really stuck the knife in, in both the directors and Newcastle. The third concept was actually to try and lampoon the whole suggestion that these two characters have actually tried to put down the people in the north of England and we've actually just tried to reverse it to actually lampoon them and what they've actually said to make it on, on a more humorous side so people just won't take them too seriously. Just as an extra we came up with, thought, why not throw in some T-shirts? These could be worn, for example, um, like beauty contests at Newcastle United. Um, again, not on a serious approach. We'll try and sell these down the big market later on, and there's a couple of ideas on those. So if you see these down the big market, you know where they came from. But how much did that comment about dogs really hurt the women of the North East? We've got some of the uh, Newcastle United women's team here. Joanne, were you hurt by all this being talk about dogs? Not really. Um... Most of the, you know, the lads in the north anyway think that, so it's just because of the, of the gym. It's just because of the position that they're in that it's been made such a fuss of. Had it been anybody in the big market saying it, then nothing would have been thought of. Well, you just give them a clout, would you? <laughs> Cheryl, how about you? I feel exactly the same as Joanne. Just what Joanne said is exactly true. Like, it's because of the position what these men are in. It's why it's been such, like, made such a big deal. Like, if any public person had said that, but the media have picked up upon it so greatly. I don't think so. OK, well, we've talked to quite a few women in here and that's been a common position, so let's move on. Kevin Miles, um, what's the way forward from this? We've seen a lot of talk of fan power here. W what do we do next? Well, I think one of the lessons of the whole experience is that if the voice of ordinary supporters had been heard at the highest level in the club, this fiasco wouldn't have happened. I think there's an urgent case for the fans who are the biggest supporters of the team, who are the biggest financial contributors of the team and yet have no say in the running of the club. That situation's got to change. Fans have got to give them a voice. You want them on the board? 
at every level of, of football. It's not such a far-fetched idea. On the continent, in Barcelona, for instance, John Hall has talked about making Newcastle like Barcelona. At Barcelona, 105,000 fans each have one equal vote and elect the entire board and the president. What, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. OK, Steve, would that work in Newcastle? I think it's Klaukutu land, basically. I cannot really see that ever happening at, at that level. And basically, as I'm told time and time again, whenever I go to a match home or away, and I must admit, I don't get to many away games because I run a business, um, Newcastle United fans, there's 36,000 different opinions, plus probably 10 to 15,000 on the waiting list. It can never, never happen. OK, thank you all very much. Oh, thanks to our host at the Springbank Social Club. Jackie, back to you. Thanks very much, Simon. Right, uh, Nicola, let's for once and for all set this, this dog's issue aside. Is there a culture change now so that it is unacceptable to say that kind of thing and that men will no longer risk those kind of derogatory comments in the footballing world? I think if it's, um, if it's being said on, on a high level, no, it's, it's unacceptable because the club are trying to get families to go to, the, uh, to Newcastle. Uh, for years, it's always been a male oriented sport and a few women have been intruding into it. More women are going to the matches, more women are feeling confident going to the matches. Uh, they're trying to encourage children to go as well. But if that's the sort of respect they have for the people that are trying to encourage to go at the match, well, it's all wrong. All right, have we reached, uh, John, some sort of watershed here where now football is going to have a different image and a different kind of culture? This is a turning point. I think it boils down to the fact that there's so much money in the game now. Um, people are throwing money at left, right and centre. Uh, the average fan is, is going to be left behind, really. It's becoming more and more corporate. Um, and that's where all the money's coming from. So if it's more corporate, there are corporate women around, aren't there? Yeah, there's more and more uh, women going to, to football matches now. I mean, um, you see it week in, week out at St James's. There's women all over the place and they're taking a, a real interest in the game. OK. Uh, David, do you think we're going to see a culture change? Is this some kind of turning point, or has it just been flying the ointment for a while? Well, I, I hope sincerely that it is not going to be a flying the ointment and it is going to be a genuine uh, change of that people are going to realise who is running their football clubs, that football isn't just this glamorous, colourful thing, that the city's good for it, that all the money's good for it. While we've been talking about these individuals making huge multi-millions out of it, at the same time school teams and youth teams in Newcastle and elsewhere are crying out for a few quid. It's a deeply unequal game. Its grassroots are being squeezed and are declining at the same time as all this corporate entertaining is going on for thousands of pounds ahead in the games. Da David Young, are they talking sort of pie in the sky here? Is there any chance of any of this coming to pass? The money trickling down, more democracy? I think we can get a happy medium here. I think that you can bring, if you can harness the enormous passion of the North East uh, in support of their football teams, to provide the funds to make these, these teams both the finan financially the strongest and to have a situation where the fans are happy that they are providing those funds because the teams are doing in extremely well, then I think you've got the result that everybody would be happy with. I don't think we would be getting all this criticism of the PLC if Newcastle was top of the Premiership and was marching in the Champions League. That's and that's today what it comes down to. That's the bottom line, isn't it, Nicola? That you're not doing so well, so the knives are out. I don't always think that I have that opinion. I think um, if someone's done anything to tarnish our name, then we want some justice done. I don't know. I, I, I think if Newcastle win the next three league games, win the semi-final of, of the Cup against Sheffield United and end up at Wembley, I think this will all be forgotten about a lot sooner uh, rather than later. Isn't that the bottom line? Well, I, I don't think that that makes it right. You know, it, well, I'm not if, saying it makes it right, but I'm saying if a few people that's forget the way it's about it, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be reform. And if people are talking about harnessing supporters again so that they put their money into this company, then why can't they have a stake in this company? What, people are talking about a club. It's not a club. And if people are going to carry on calling it a club, why can't they make it a club? Football clubs are supposed to be community sporting institutions. And that's still what Sir John Hall talks about it as. Uh, great for the North East, a sporting institution. But it isn't. It's a public company making money for himself, his family and a few other shareholders. But I do think it can be run, run so that both objectives are satisfied. The club, if it's run at its absolute best, will make the fans happy. To be, I'm, to be I'm going to stop it. you there. Thanks all very much indeed. Well, that brings us to a close of ten amazing days in the history of Newcastle United. My thanks to all my guests here in the studio and, of course, the fans. Supporters everywhere will be hoping that the headlines in the next few weeks are full of more trips to Wembley and Gaza's arrival in Middlesbrough. From us all, though, for now, a very good night.